with a geophysics specialty from the University of California, Santa Cruz. In 2000, she worked as a seismologist at the University of Utah. And she is currently the Associate Director of the University of Utah Seismograph Stations and a research professor in the Department of Geology and Geophysics. She's the Secretary of the Seismological Society of America, is the Advanced National Seismic System Regional Coordinator for the Intermountain Region, and is a member of the Utah Mine Safety Technical Advisory Council. Her recent research papers include studies related to the 2020 Magna Utah earthquake, other Utah seismic sequences, developing new seismic detection algorithms, and seismic network operations. Current research projects of hers include continued analysis of Utah and Intermountain Mountain seismicity and seismic hazard, seismic monitoring at the Utah Frontier Observatory for Research in Geothermal Energy, or FORGE, and new methods to detect and characterize seismic sources. So today, she's presenting specifically on unusual earthquakes in the Black Rock volcanic field in the Sevier Desert of Utah. We're really privileged and grateful to have her, so I'll go ahead and turn the time over to Chris. Thanks so much. Great. Thank you for the introduction, and uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm going to see if I can get my screen shared again. Um, let's see, did that pop up? Yep, we're seeing it. Okay, great. Um, so, yeah, so thank you. And today, as mentioned, I'm gonna talk about some unusual earthquakes that occurred out in the Black Rock volcanic field. Um, I wanna point out that this work was largely done by a postdoc, Maria Mesomeri. She has uh, since returned back to Europe. Um, so it's up to me to do the presentation today. And um, I also wanted to uh, acknowledge this photo actually comes from a survey note. So thank you, uh, Utah Geological Survey for putting out great resources uh, that we can go grab. But I thought maybe I should show some rocks uh, for this presentation. Um, it will largely be based on more uh, geophysics types of observ uh, observations. Um, so the work that I'm presenting today is published in uh, geophysical research letters. And I wanna talk about the title here for a minute of the publication. Um, here it's possibly related to the Black Rock Volcanic Field. This was an iteration on titles. Uh, one title had it being related to dike injection. Um, we went through the review process and, and we're left with possibly related. So I'm hopeful at the end um, with the group that's assembled and the work that some of you have probably done in this area to have a nice discussion on where, where we've ended with, with things here. So with that, I wanna start and talk about why, why, I titled the, why the paper's titled Unusual. So at seismograph stations, um, we monitor seismic events. And by seismic, I'm just meaning anything that's recorded by a seismometer. That's largely earthquakes. So all the, the dots on this map are earthquakes that have been recorded by seismograph stations. This particular map is from around 1981 to about 2010. I haven't updated the map. Our earthquakes tend to occur in many of the same locations. We monitor seismic activity up in Yellowstone National Park related to the hydrothermal system up there. Um, the main source of seismicity in Utah runs along the Intermountain Seismic Belt, so it extends from Montana down into Arizona. Um, in Utah, roughly following the I-15 corridor. At the Escalante Valley, there's also this, this zone that sort of branches off and heads into the uh, Southern Nevada Shear Zone. So our, our seismicity in Utah, and by this I mean our tectonic seismicity, is largely concentrated in the Intermountain Seismic Belt. We also have other sources of seismicity. So we have uh, the, coal, the central Utah coal fields where we get mining induced seismicity. We have um, fluid injected seismicity related to the Paradox Basin down on the Colorado Utah border. Um, we have seismic activity that's related to blasting and um, detonations out at the military facilities. And then these colored circles are where we typically have, or where we have quarries where we have known blasts, which produce signal. So we have lots of um, types of seismic signals here in Utah. So the first thing I wanna point out and why these are called unusual is these earthquakes I'm gonna largely talk about today are located here um, 
out out in the Black Rock um, volcanic field, and I'll show a better um, map here in a minute. But I wanted to show this one here because if you look within this blue circle, we don't have any gray circles. There's a blasting site that's down sort of on the southern end, so pretty far away from where these events are that I'll talk about. So we don't have any any known sources of seismicity in this particular area. Okay. We've actually even done studies out in this area trying to find seismicity. So um, each of these boxes is the rough location of where we put out geophone arrays at different points in time to look for small earthquakes. And uh, this is from a study that was uh, published by a former master student, Andy Trow, and a number of other students were on this particular paper. Um, so what we did was we um, used enhanced detection using these really sensitive geophones right over the top of areas. So this Twin Peak box is kind of where the Black Rock Desert is. And I want to point out for detections, um, the boxes on the label correspond to when the events were detected. So when the Dog Valley Array was out, we detected the events that are red. When the Crater Knoll Array was out, we detected these light blue, Forge, the dark blue. Twin Peaks is green. And there's a few events sort of closer to Dog Valley, but only, you know, one event here um, that was uniquely classified um, within this particular area. So even if we go to more sensitive um, detection algorithms, we still don't find earthquakes in this area. So the first reason these are called unusual is they're occurring in an area where we don't typically have seismic events. The second reason um, these are unusual is just from the waveform. And before I get into the actual events I'm talking about, this is a paper from Jim Peshman and others on the Crandall Canyon mine collapse. In this upper left, we're just looking at um, five seconds and on the vertical channel. And um, the other three traces are the full record. The upper plot is from the the mine collapse and the lower plot is from an earthquake that was at roughly the same distance from the station. And I want to bring this up because to me, this is a really nice example that shows, you know, what we can tell just from the waveforms. So for typical Utah tectonic earthquakes, they're more, more impulsive. We have a really nice clear P arrival. For mining events, we have a really emergent arrival. We see different frequency contents um, between the two events. Um, really nice, clearly defined shear wave from, this, from the tectonic earthquake. So when we look at the waveforms from events, we have kind of what's typical and what we expect from, say, intermountain seismic tectonic, seismic belt tectonic earthquakes. And then we have other earthquakes or other seismic events like this. Crandall Canyon event. Okay, so let's let's move into the Black Rock and talk about these earthquakes um, in more detail. So, here's a better reference map on the left. We see the Intermountain Seismic Belt. We have some black dots here representing earthquakes. We've outlined the Black Rock Desert Volcanic Field in this dash line. We have the Younger Volcanics here shown in pink. We got seismic stations as the triangles. And this box here is blown up over to the right to show more of our immediate study area. We're going to focus on three earthquakes today. Um, it's kind of another unusual aspect is between September 12th of 2018 and April 14th of 2019, we had three magnitude four and larger earthquakes in this one area, which is somewhat unusual in and of itself. Um, two of those events were out here in the Black Rock um, Desert Volcanic Field. One event was just off to the east, um, closer to the mountains here. Um, we'll come back to this later, but at the same time as the April event, um, we were doing some experiments down at Forge. So we had a, a geophone array set over the Forge area, and we'll come back to that data um, later in the talk. 
Um, as we go through the talk, um, the events are color coded and the colors stay the same. So in both type and on maps, if it's blue, it's the September event. If it's black, it's the February event, and that's the event that was over by the mountains. And red is the April event, again, in the uh, volcanic field. Okay. All right. So let's go back to this idea of unusual waveforms. And here's um, a picture of the September event, the April event, and the February event. So the two events um, closer to the Black Rock volcanic field and the event closer to the mountains. And I'm going to skip forward and then we're going to come back to these. So things that we're going to look for, I'm going to tell you, uh, the events in the Black Rock Desert are unusual. So they're shallow. They begin with high frequencies. The long period energy begins right after the P waves. It decays with epicentral distance. We don't have clear S phase on the vertical or radio components, and the signal duration is about 100 seconds. And that's comparable to the deep event, the event by the mountains, and we'll talk more about what the actual depths are here shortly, where we have clear P and S arrivals and long period energy consistent with surface waves. So if we go back and look at what I just typed there, we have the raw records, we have records that have been low pass filtered. So we're looking at lower frequencies. We're looking at the higher frequencies in this panel, and then we are looking at the spectra of the energy. And so for these two events out in the Black Rock area, we have this really high frequency energy right at the beginning. The duration of this, these events are greater than 100 seconds. And we compare that to the the more standard earthquake where we have this shorter duration around 50 seconds or so. Here we have clear P waves and S waves. We do get longer period energy, but you can see it's coming in after the shear arrival. Whereas for these events um, out in the Black Rock Desert, we have longer period energy for the duration of the event. And the short period energy is, or, or high frequency energy is at the beginning. And if we just look at the spectra for these events under the Black Rock Desert, we have these lower frequencies compared to um, the event um, closer to the mountains, which is much more broadband in its frequency signal. So for us, these, these events are unusual. The waveforms are, are unusual. We were curious when we responded to it um, what type of event this was. and potentially wondering if it was some type of induced um, type of event. And we'll come back to that again as well. So that was just for one station. If we look at four stations that span different distances, again, September and April, the two events in the Black Rock, and then the February event, the closer to the mountains. Again, we see that the signal changes as the distance changes as as would be expected for any event. We see that for the more typical earthquake, but the observations that we made are, are still the same. We still have differences in frequency content, differences in duration, um, harder to see the S wave. The top panel are the vertical components and the bottom panel here are the radial components, so a horizontal component. Okay, so, you know, I, I, I did warn you at the beginning, we're going to be talking more about the geophysics. So I wanted to actually talk about sources. So one way we can rule out what type of source it is, is actually um, inverting for the source type. And we use a moment tensor to do this. Um, and a moment tensor describes the deformation at the source location that generates the seismic waves. So I'm sure a lot of you are used to looking at focal mechanism plots, which show the potential fault planes for um, an earthquake. And right, we it's a lower hemisphere projection. We get two fault planes um, that we can't distinguish which plane the earthquake um, occurred on without some secondary information. And you can get the fault plane information out of the moment tensor as well. But what I want to focus on is also out of this moment tensor, which we get by inverting waveforms from uh, several stations, is we can look at more um, detailed aspects of the source. And there's three types of sources that these 
that a moment tensor decomposes into. One is an isotropic source. So this would be um, a volumetric source. So when you have expansion, like an explosion, you would see an isotropic source. Or contraction, like, a, like crack closing, like we had at Crandall Canyon, um, you get an isotropic signature in the moment tensor. What we're more typically used to looking at is the double couple, and that's where we have two force couples um, that result in the shear location. And this is typically what we see in the focal mechanism, although some focal mechanisms actually have some of these other contributions, depending on how it's plotted. But this is largely what we're looking at, are those two fault planes that form the force couple. The third aspect is a CLVD, which stands for Compensated Linear Vector Dipole. Okay, formally it's the normal displacement from one linear dipole is compensated by opposing displacement from the other two linear vector dipoles. This results in no net volume change. So one way to think about this is if you have a tube of toothpaste with the lid on it and you squeeze the tube of toothpaste, right? You're, you get deformation associated with that squeezing, but the volume, as long as you leave the lid on, hasn't changed. So you're pushing in one direction and it's being compensated in the other directions. Um, so this can tell us a lot about um, how the source originated and the mechanism if we can decompose the moment tensor. And if we, you know, a moment tensor is a, is a matrix, so it's a mathematical construction. We have all these different force couples that go into uh, how, how this is actually constructed. And I won't go into any of that, but I just wanted to, to give people a visual of that we're talking about force couples. So if we move into the earthquakes of interest um, here, I'm showing this on a tape plot, which is a way to take that mathematical tensor and visualize it for the the components of how isotropic the CLVD components of a source um, and double couple would plot. So if you have a pure double couple earthquake, it's gonna plot in the center. If you have a pure explosion, it's gonna plot at the top. A crack closing implosion plots at the bottom. Um, CLVD components would plot along this the um, horizontal axes and then variations of isotropic and CLDV or linear vector dipoles plot off. Now, as I said, this was done from an inversion. So there's some, um, we're taking real data that has real noise and information about a velocity model that may be incomplete and we're inverting that data for what the source properties are. And in work that Catherine Whidden has done, she's shown that for Utah earthquakes, they plot roughly in this pink zone. So the trade-off between the noise and velocity models and data and what we can do with the inversion, there's where most of those events are probably truly double couple, we have this this ellipsoid of where they're, we call permissible for sort of standard earthquakes in Utah. Okay, so that we can think of it as kind of an error bar. So if they're plotting within this, we'd call it, you know, sort of a deviatoric source, double couple source um, along faults. And as you move away from this circle, we get to what we might call more of an unusual source, not what we think of as an earthquake. So if we look at the September event, again, our blue event, it plots out here away from where we think of as typical Utah earthquakes. It has an isotropic component to it, so showing some type of crack closing. Whereas the events closer to the mountains and the April event um, that was in the Black Rock Desert are plotting on the edge of what we think is permissible for um, the double couple or type of earthquake. So in this sense, um, one of our events is showing up as being unusual. And if we look at this, um, we'll start and just look at the first few columns um, for these events. 
Um, the other thing we get when we invert for that moment tensor is we get the depth of the event. So these are depths that are from um, the moment tensors. Um, so for these two events in the Black Rock Desert, we get one kilometer and three kilometers for depth, and this is depth below surface, this, the ground surface. And for the event closer to the mountains, we get 11 kilometers, which is more typical for an earthquake, so sort of 10, 10 kilometers or so. Our seismic moments are 4.0, 4.1, and 4.1. And we can look at how much of each of these events it falls into the CLVD isotropic and double couple component when we do the moment tensor decomposition. So again, for that September event, we have a large CLVD and significant isotropic components as compared to the double couple. Whereas for the other two events, um, they're largely double couple with some CLVD, which is probably that trade-off between um, noise and, and signal in the inversion. So we have these super shallow events, right? One, three kilometers below the surface, um, luckily, uh, we have a colleague at the USGS, Bill Barnhart, who specializes in INSAR images, and he went and looked at the INSAR data for us. So these are data collected by satellites looking at inter interferograms. And for the September event and the April event, the two shallow events occurring out in the Black Rock Desert, we see these nice interferograms that are representative of deformation on the surface that was generated by these shallow earthquakes. Um, notably, these are probably the two smallest earthquakes that have been imaged with INSAR. We typically get INSAR images from large earthquakes that have large displacements. Um, and so this is, this is unusual as well, that we were able to see um, these earthquakes in the INSAR data. The February event, the more tectonic looking event does not have an INSAR signature. Uh, Bill tried to model these earthquakes and um, the signal's too small to get to the, the fault geometry, but he was able to get at depth and magnitude for these two events. And when we look at that, the depth that he gets for these two events out in the Black Rock um, Desert volcanic area is less than a kilometer, okay? We're looking at meters now. And for the September event, he gets a moment magnitude similar to what we got with the seismic magnitude. But for the April event, his moment magnitude is three to four units, 0.3 to 0.4 units larger than what we saw for the seismic moment. This is indicative of the fact that some of the energy released in this earthquake was not released in seismic energy, but actually a seismic energy. So when we look at these two sources, the seismic um, decomposition tells us that the September event had some type of isotropic component to it, which is unusual for a tectonic earthquake. And the April event probably has some type of a seismic slip associated with it which is not readily um, documented in typical tectonic earthquakes, or not that I'm aware of. So what does this mean? We have shallow events. We have a significant isotropic component. We have potential aseismic slip. We're located in a volcanic field um, with young volcanics. In writing this paper, I learned there's some discrepancy between the dates on the, the basalts out there, so that, that might be something we can chat about later. Um, but I'm going to leave it. I think it's fair to say they're young. Um, Stahl and others have proposed that the far field strain um, for the black if you look at sort of the black rock area and the far field strain, you really need um, episodic dike intrusion and associated faulting in the upper crust to, ex to explain that far field strain signature. There's also this complication with ring faults um, that can play into the source properties in terms of CLVD components and such. Um, I know there's faults out there um, within the Black Rock Desert. Um, 
I'm not sure if they technically be considered ring faults, although it seems likely that they would given the definitions um, that I've um, read. So let's continue with this idea. You know, we're out in the volcanic field. These are shallow. Does it does it make sense? Or you know, are these really young volcanics, and could there still be some type of volcanic signature? So. Um, this is a figure that I borrowed from a report that Phil Wanamaker's put together um, for the area, and this is focusing on the heat flow, and we have heat flow contours here, and this is North Twin Peak, and you see it's encompassed by a contour of 200 um, milliwatts per meter squared um, heat flow, so it's hot out here, so it's not um, unreasonable in my mind to think that there's some type of heat source in this area. And then if we come back to this model proposed by Stahl, you know, we've got thinning of crust in this area. We've got um, the, you know, they call it the abandoned uh, severe desert detachment. So what's going on with this, this structure that's been debated, whether it's low angle normal fault or what this really is. but. When you include that and you look at the, the strain um, from geodetic points of view, you the lower crust extension is taken up with um, distributed shear, but you really have to have some type of um, dike injection and shallow magnet, magnetism um, in the upper crust to accommodate this, this particular model as well. So based on these um, couple of things, and um, an interaction at AGU that uh, Maria had with some volcano seismologists, um, we started to pursue this idea of a volcanic source. So the first thing we did was we got more data. So as I mentioned when we started, um, the um, April event occurred at a time when we had a geophone array out at FORGE. So here's FORGE down here. This is what our geophone array looked like. We treated this as an array and stack signals so we could get smaller, smaller events um, and look for additional or events in the sequence to see if we could say anything more about geometry of uh, the faulting or um, just any additional information that might be there. So um, we tried four different techniques, and I don't want to dwell on this. Um, some worked better than others. The more pink dots and less gray dots you see are the better, are the detection algorithms that work better. Some of them we weren't able to recover all of the catalog events, um, but we we were able to recover several events um, down into the minus magnitude minus two range, certainly getting down to zero. We also found a new foreshock that was not in the UUSS catalog and an aftershock that was also missed in the UUSS catalog. Um, the aftershock was missed because it was in the coda of the main shock um, and this foreshock was just really small. I'll point out why especially this foreshock is, is interesting to me as we, as we move forward. So for this particular sequence, we're left with um, 33 earthquakes. They're plotted um, in map view on the left here. I want to note that this is a two kilometer scale here. So this is a very small area we're looking at. We have the foreshock and the main shock, and then the distribution of the events. They're, the size of the circle is um, a function of the magnitude of the earthquake. Um, these aren't great locations. We didn't have great geometry of stations right over the top, um, but it is interesting that they're locating in a small area. If we look at the waveforms located at, a, at the same station for all of these events, I believe this is TCRU, um, a few things um, will jump out. If we look at the, the main shock here, and a couple of these aftershocks, it's really clear that we have different frequency content than the other events. And especially the main shock is much more um, low frequency and has lower frequency content than these other events. The other thing that's a little bit striking is that for such a small area, if we think of what what actually generates the wiggles that we record from, from an earthquake, 
we have the source. So if you're slipping along the same fault, the, the energy that comes from the source is going to look the same. And if you travel to the station, the same station, the path that it travels is the same. And if it's recorded on the same instrument, the instrument's the same. So for events that are occurring in a small area so that the path doesn't change um, from the same fault, so the same type of um, slip functions, this, the source isn't changing, we'd expect the waveforms to be fairly similar or to have sort of maybe patches of similar waveforms. And if we actually correlate the P arrivals from all of those events from a number of our broadband stations in the area, our correlation coefficients are quite low. So these, these events weren't very similar. And here we're showing a box plot, so sort of the range of correlation coefficients. Okay. So what is the implication of these dissimilar waveforms? Well, the first would maybe be we're rupturing several small patches. So the, the orientation of the fault that it's occurring on um, changes um, within this, you know, five kilometer area so that we're the actual geometry of the fault changes so that our source properties are changing for these events. It could also be indicative of the passage of fluids going through that could actually change the sources as well. Okay. So all of this is leading to, you know, are these volcanic earthquakes? And um, one way to look at volcanic earthquakes is with something called the frequency index, where we're looking at the logarithm of the mean amplitude ratio between high frequencies and low frequencies. And in this, we get a couple of end members, sort of the volcano tectonic end member that has a frequency index greater than, say, minus 0.4. And this would, the mechanism would be brittle failure, shear failure driven by volcanic forcing. We also have long period events and the frequency index is less than minus 1.3. These tend to be sources associated with resonance um, with, from magmatic or hydrothermal fluids. And in between, we call these hybrid. So some combination of shear failure and fluid movement. Once you get to about zero, you're more in sort of the tectonic um, category and you're out of this volcanic regime. So if we look at the frequency index results for the 2019 April sequence, and you can see here the um, frequency bands we're looking at between 5 to 10 hertz and 0.5 to 2 hertz, we see that the sequence starts with an event that is largely tectonic, so its frequency index is at zero. That was the force shock that was detected. The main shock is down here at almost minus one. So we're getting in sort of these pinkish colors are our long period energy. This white is our hybrid. And as we move closer into tectonic earthquakes. So we see we have a number of events that are falling into this hybrid category. Then we get more tectonic. Then we get some events that have more longer period energy. Um, so these events are all somewhat unusual and indicative of some type of hybrid source mechanism that, that might include some type of volcanic forcing or fluid forcing. Um, we don't have the same number of events for the 2018 sequence. These are events that were detected and located by seismograph stations. I forgot to mention the top has the magnitude, um, same frequency content. Again, this sequence started with an event that was largely tectonic. Then the main shock is this longer period event. And we again have sort of these longer period events and some more hybrid in nature. So again, just an unusual sequence um, for us here in Utah. So I'm coming to the conclusions. I purposely left this a little bit short um, on the talk, because I'm hoping to get some discussion with maybe some of you that have, might have worked on these rocks or looked out there. So where we are is, um, are these volcanic in origin? Are there other possibilities? Um, I have a colleague who keeps pushing on me that doesn't think they're volcanic in origin, and my, my answer is, 
I can tell you my observations. What I observe is these are unusual earthquakes for Utah and unusual in that they locate in the volcanic field. They have unusual waveforms for what we expect. They're very shallow. One of the events has a volumetric component to the source. The other has what seems to be an aseismic contribution to the source. The frequency index calculations are consistent with what they find in volcanic areas in terms of maybe these uh, hybrid or volcano tectonic type events. It fits into a model that was proposed um, based on geodetic data, so another type of data source. Um, so that's what I, I can tell you about these particular events. Comments, criticisms, these are these are such shallow events. You know, if if you go with the INSAR calculations, these are less than a kilometer deep. So why why don't we see something at the surface? Or why don't we see fluids or um, even you know uh, magma or what's going on there? And then this idea of ring faults, is this really something that's happening on the structure? Um, I personally am wondering if we're, we have something um, happening at depth and it's driving these um, more shallow processes. So maybe if we are following stall and deeper in the crust, we have some type of aseismic um, dike intrusion. Um, so something that's a slow process, which is consistent with um, the, the strain rates out here um, that we didn't pick up seismically, but what we see is the redistribution of stress more shallow. Um, I'm not really sure, but our observations are consistent with what we see from other volcanic um, regions in the world, but there are these um, potential issues. And with that, um, I will say thank you and uh, see if there's questions. Wonderful presentation, Chris, really appreciate it. Feel free to either chime in on the chat or just turn on your mic and ask questions. Thanks, Chris, that was, that was an awesome presentation. It was really interesting. Um, I did a little bit of work looking at the severe desert detachment in my grad studies and just wondered if, so th this is about where the severe desert detachment uh, reaches the surface, right? Yeah, and that's what pretty, pretty plays close. into the modeling done by Stahl and others is sort of that, that location of the severe desert detachment with the Black Rock Desert uh, Volcanics. Are, are there other, um, and I'm sure you've researched this a bunch, but are there other places to that have kind of the same signature that you're that you've identified this unique signature and and in different environments or you know can you kind of tie it to any other analog? Um, not that I was able to do. We did get some great comments. Um, this paper was actually one of the best reviewed papers. Um, I've seen um, a little bit uh, frustrating as the person who wrote it because there were so many great comments to go look at, um, but at least it was very thoughtful. And so we looked some at the ring fault structures in Hawaii that have some similar type source mechanisms, and that's where that idea of the ring faults came in. Um, the Socorro um, magma um, complex down in New Mexico has some similarities in terms of the rates, but I, there hasn't been any sources like this that I'm aware of that um, have been located there. But that would be sort of the other analog that was uh, pointed out to me. Okay, yeah, thank you. Sure. So a couple questions popped up in the chat. The first is from Eugene Zemanski. I apologize if I mispronounce that, but he asked, how do these waveforms compare to those observed in other extensional settings associated with shallow volcanism, like the EAR and the Red Sea Rift? I know that recent seismogenic dike intrusion has been documented in the Central Arabian Rift flank. That's actually a really good point, and I, I did not go look at that data. 
in my literature search, nothing came up for that area, but that's uh, certainly a good place for me to go um, look in more detail because it is um, more shallow. Oh, that would be great if you send the papers. I'd appreciate that. So another question sent from Mike Highland, really interesting, any way of differentiating movement associated with magma versus groundwater? Uh, not that I know of, um, you know, I, well, if we had a lot of data, right, one thing you can back out if, if it's really related to some type of fluid diffusion, you can look at viscosity, right? So you can, you could back out from the, the diffusion parameters, right? So maybe go from diffusion to viscosity to see if it's more water-like or more magma-like and work like that's been done by Dave Shelley up in Yellowstone, but they have, you know, those are the Yellowstone swarms that have hundreds of events that you can go back and, and look at. So we don't really have the data. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't that energetic. Maybe we should be happy about that. Um, although as someone who wants data, sometimes you want a little bit more to work with. So. So Jim um, Peckman asked, you started out with the Crandall Canyon mine collapse. Have you calculated the FI for coal mining related events? I'm wondering if the values are controlled by depth or source. Um, we have not calculated the frequency index values for the coal mining events. And um, it could be a function of how shallow it is, but the I think an important distinction between the events we saw in Black Rock and um, say Crandall Canyon is also the duration of the event. And um, these events in the Black Rock started with that really high frequency energy, whereas the Crandall Canyon event was very um, emergent and sort of had a much uh, longer period signature to the, to the P wave. Um, so I guess, um, I, while well, we would have to look at it for sure, but I, there could be some differences just look from the waveform um, characteristics um, that we saw today. There are definitely differences. And, and as Jim knows, we did try and figure out if these were some type of collapse or something going on and look for mines in the area and such at the time. Um, but there that doesn't seem to be much out there. Thank you. Any other questions before we wrap up for the day? Uh, Chris Kravitz says, Chris, has anyone been on the surface since the events? Do you have any ground gas, like helium data, changes in um, surface water temperature? I don't have any data, no. Um, they Given the timing when we were writing this up and figuring out what was going on, it was hard for us to travel. Um, so by the time we had sort of gotten to this idea that these were volcanic related, we were um, into COVID and getting out into the field was not as easy anymore. So, but it would be great if someone out there does, you know, that type of work to, to look at that. Well, Chris, thank you so much. Super fascinating research. Really appreciate your time to share that with us and all the hard work that went into learning this really interesting information. Thank you everyone for coming, participating, asking questions, and again, giving your support to the UGA. We really appreciate it. Um, look forward to hopefully seeing you at our field trip here coming up and in the next month or so other events that we host. So thanks again, everyone, for your support and time. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having me.